Hello and welcome. I'm Alex Promos, Head of Institutional Content and Investment Magazine, and this is Market Narratives. This show is a series of unorthodox conversations with thought leaders influencing the world of fiduciary investors. For more related insights and analysis, please remember to check out our website, investmentmagazine.com.au, and subscribe for a free email. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. Well, welcome, Andrew Lill, Chief Investment Officer of Rest Super. Thank you, Alex. It's great to be here. Well, it's an amazing time to interview you. It's been now, I think it's nine months. We're just almost ticking over in the new role at Rest. Maybe give us a bit of a a feel for the past nine months and and what that process has has looked like for you. Well, sure thing, Alex. I mean, I'd start by saying kind of what a um, truly interesting sort of time to be both uh, investing across the world, investing in superannuation in Australia, where clearly there's a lot of regulatory change and initiatives underway. And um, we've also chosen this time, with a lot happening in the kind of the external environment, to do quite a lot in our own internal environment as well around uh, really implementing the uh, recommendations from a governance review that was conducted in 2019. And so I've been working through the stages of that. I can very much sort of go into the kind of the the detail, but um, really in context, you say I'm very fortunate to be the first REST employed CIO. And um, I've been bringing together two investment teams. I've been working on a member-focused investment strategy. I've been interacting with the broader leadership team of, of REST under Vicky Doyle's leadership. And, uh, you know, reacting to both the, the, the past performance and the regulatory challenges that we've been, you know, having kind of this, this year. So lots of detail to go into, but I would just say I'm enjoying the challenge. I feel like this is sort of the, the time in my particular career where I can bring to sort of bring to bear all the experience that I've sort of gathered and gained and uh, in conjunction with some of my colleagues and team, put that into place at a really critical and exciting kind of time for, for rest as it really goes into its version 2.0 of its uh, evolution. It's interesting you talked about the change and now your role as CIO and historically it was almost a, a GM investments, which I would, you know, I- Curious to get your thoughts around what that transition looks like, and then more specifically, you know, your role previously being at Morningstar. You know, how does that role sort of transitioned into into rest? Yeah, well, I think perhaps for those that sort of you know haven't followed sort of the path of of um, rest investments, I'd probably say that um, there were actually four critical stakeholders in the development of the rest investment portfolio. And first off, it's really important to say that you know one of the things that really attracted me about this role was that REST does have a tremendous heritage in being a kind of an investments-led super fund. It's had a strong background in investment performance and in many ways being an investment leader in, you know, the evolution of sort of some some parts of super fund investing that are sort of seen as kind of at the forefront today. It's also had a great investment performance background too. So the four sort of stakeholders that really kind of brought together the investment portfolio in the past so first off, there was a, a chairman of the, of the investment committee. John Nolan was uh, a very strong investor and uh, as a member of the investment committee was sort of deemed to be the, the key investment advisor. The role of Jana was also critical. So Jana brought a number of their perhaps strongest sort of consultants into one team that sort of supported REST. And uh, they were in many ways providing kind of the outsourced CIO function for certain parts of the investment portfolio. There was a GM Investments in Sydney who was primarily responsible for implementation and operations. And there was a head of investments in Melbourne of the organisation previously uh, known as SIM that was a wholly owned investment management company of REST where they also had a a head function that would be very responsible for bringing kind of the capabilities of that um, internal function to the investment committee. So if you like, those four sort of stakeholders really kind of brought together what was the REST investment portfolio in the past. And the investment governance review that was conducted by Ashby Monk in 2019 really recommended that the move towards a single CIO responsible for investment strategy, investment implementation, operations, and some of the internal investment teams in conjunction with an investment committee that was overseeing, not doing the investing alongside Jana as the appointed consultant of the investment committee, but 
again, supporting, not delivering the recommendations was the way forward. And uh, between that review in 2019 and my arrival in August 2020, you know, much of that sort of integration and that sort of that new way of working was put in place. And uh, since my arrival, I've just been continuing to work on that path whereby I've been building a whole of fund investment management team internally at REST and also uh, working with the board investment committee towards getting the full delegations from that investment committee to basically manage the, the fund with their oversight. It's interesting. I've just been keeping a close eye on, on the amount of changes at REST and uh, I've got a, a running tally now of nine people uh, across global equities, capital markets, investment strategies, CFO, Australian equities, listed assets, head of operations. Like it's it's very wide. I'm curious around, you know, how many more people are you looking for? What are you specifically looking for to build out that team? And also, you know, how is the existing uh, internal team that you had, which was, uh, you could call it SIM, but I think we knew it as uh, Super Investments, I think it was called. You know, how, how are they now placed within the broader group? I mean, I think that... Uh most observers would say that REST is growing quickly. I think that most of the large super funds are growing at a, a rapid pace. Perhaps sort of some of our recent appointments perhaps have been more kind of in the traditional limelight. So they are kind of front office roles. And I sort of see those as critical because these were the roles that traditionally Jana and John Nolan conducted together. And they're pretty important when you think about um, you know either investment strategy and asset allocation or the whole area of equities that for most super funds is is probably half at least of their portfolio. So those were kind of the missing pieces in my sort of internal management investment team. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased with where we've got to as far as sort of bringing in people that can have that expertise in their particular sectors, but also think from that whole of fund member perspective. Will it continue? Well, I think that there's still a lot of the areas that are that need to be kind of worked through. I mean, one of the other recommendations of the governance review was that value adding risk management was going to be increasingly important. When you think about the connectedness of a whole of fund or a total portfolio approach, then it's not just having kind of experts in different sectors. It's about how the whole packaging of that manufacturing process works towards sort of the, the product that the end investor, our member, receives. So risk management are areas that I'm going to be continuing to work on and potentially bring some new people in. And then also operational infrastructure. I think it's one of the things that um, is often forgotten, but is probably the most critical in getting smart investors to work together in a collaborative environment is the technology and data management sort of piece. And uh, it feels a little bit like kind of the analogy of a house that needs a renovation in that you start by thinking that you're just going to renovate the uh, the bathroom and the, and the kitchen. And uh, by the time you finished, you kind of, you've renovated the whole house. That's a little bit what we're going through, that when you start thinking about, well, I need to fill these gaps, and then you think about, well, what's going to be critical for those new people to be able to work in, a, in an environment that suits their skills and they can deliver the added value, then those additional areas, risk management, technology, systems, portfolio systems, data management are going to be very important. So that's sort of where we're going to continue growing. I think that um, Vicky Doyle has gone on record in saying that uh, when she joined in 2018, you know, REST was primarily a, a business that outsourced most of its operations. And um, we've gone down a path of continuing to insource most of our functions. And so since Vicky joined, we've grown from perhaps 150 to 350 today. And I think the, the path is clear towards sort of continuing to grow at that sort of uh, rate for the next one or two years. As far as the, the internal investment team, we've got great investors, primarily in the areas of real assets, unlisted assets, property, infrastructure, We've got Australian fixed income and Australian equities. Those teams are developed and developing. So we've got sort of critical mass, but I think we can get we can get bigger as um, the amount of assets that they manage increases. I would say that they've um, you know had in many cases ten years of investing on behalf of REST and its members. And so particularly, I would say the uh, the property and infrastructure teams. I would see that they're pretty mature and. It's hard to sort of see many similar teams in the super environment in Australia that sort of had the experience of owning direct assets and managing them ourselves. So I'm very fortunate to have sort of as part of my sort of team kind of coming in those areas of strength to work with and then to provide a kind of a platform as to how we want to think about internal management going forward. You mentioned there a little bit about this whole uh, fund perspective, and this is a real interesting one for most of the super funds at the moment as they think about how to build their team at the same time, making sure that they've got the unique risks that they want. There's not too much uh, concentration risk that's out there. 
The big challenge, obviously, when you start to think about a portfolio is you've got some benchmarks that come to various asset classes uh, and you've got your future, your super reforms coming through. But at the same time, you want to have this whole of fun portfolio approach. Curious to, to sort of get a, an understanding of sort of how do you think about it? How do you think about building this total portfolio when you still have almost really some, some very set silos around asset classes specifically? Yes, that's a great question. I mean, um, it is one that I've been challenged by and working through sort of during the course of those sort of first nine months. Because when I first sort of came into the business, I, I would have probably spent a lot of time thinking about how we could build a total portfolio approach towards that sort of bringing the right themes and exposures and risk focus to the overall portfolio and probably taking us away from the traditional sort of SAA approach towards that kind of outcomes focused, risk focused approach. Now, I think you can still do that in a Your Future, Your Super environment, but the degree or the tolerance that you have for taking a portfolio down that path is obviously, in my view, limited because as it stands today, the Your Future, Your Super test is a test of implementation of your SAA. So you need to be aware that you know any decision that you take to move at an asset allocation level away from your SAA is effectively both a opportunity and a risk and uh, introduces tracking error to the portfolio compared to the Your Future, Your Super benchmark. So the way that I think about that is uh, to win in this game, you have to be prepared to take risk, you know, uh, careful Development of active risk is is critical and has always been the way that at rest we've sort of functioned. But we do have a, a lower tolerance for total portfolio tracking error. So we have to decide which are of the investment views, be it at an asset allocation level or a portfolio tilt or a sort of active stock selection level, do we have greatest conviction in? Which are the investment views that we can perhaps hedge if it goes wrong in the short term? And which are the areas that we can't hedge? And so you need to be very cognizant of your overall portfolio, where your biggest active uh, risk opportunities are. And you also need to be aware that you can't take them across the whole portfolio. Like, the, you know, the, the approach where you've got active tilts and active stock selection going on in every particular sector is probably, in my view, a, a loss from the your future, your super kind of world. You, you have to decide, well, in, in this particular area, I'm probably best just keeping kind of close to the benchmark and trying to minimize operational costs and fees. Whereas in this area where I think I've got a comparative advantage, let's just make sure that I can verify that before I, I go forward. That's where I'm going to spend the majority of my fee budget, my active risk budget, my tracking error budget. It's fascinating. It reminds me, unfortunately, of the casino where you've got a limited number of chips and you're trying to work out where do I put them down. So I don't blow all my stack, but I've still got a good opportunity to get some outperformance. And this is the real challenge for, I think, all CIOs today, which is how to think about the, the various market regime that we're moving into. And then where specifically can I place chips that will be an active risk, but at the same time lead me to get some outperformance? Because at the, cent at the end of the day, for your funds, it's not just about investment performance, but there's also the business risk perspective in terms of being ranked, rated, uh, and, and make sure that you, you, you come across well to your members. So, you know, part of your thinking is how to then constantly think about where you're active um, for the fund. And, and so have you got any particular thoughts today in terms of how you may be changing your portfolio to sort of position your, your chips? Yes, Alex, we do. I mean, I think that uh, we're still aware that the, the board and board investment committee are kind of working through this with us and, and my own views. Personally, I believe that the ability to, to take a high degree of active asset allocation at the major asset class level let's call it equities versus bonds or even Australian equities versus global equities, the fact that you haven't got much breadth of chips to, to put down, I think in that casino kind of context, let's say that you've only really got seven asset classes and you decide to go you know, overweight on three of them and uh, underweight on three others. Well, over the time period of one year, which is sort of really what we're working with given that this regulation has just come in, you know, that's, a sort of a, that's a high degree of bet-specific risk. You know, it might be the right thing to do in the long term, but are you confident that it will be sort of rewarded in the next year or the next two years? Particularly with the kind of the environment, the policy environment that we have with central banks, I think that's quite a big sort of call to make as a superannuation sort of trustee. So I think those sort of those broader asset allocation bands, we're going to be keeping kind of reasonably close to our SAA. Now, just as an aside, in the past, the SAA would generally be sort of set for two or three years ahead and focused on a kind of a perhaps a five-year environment, sort of a you know a long-term capital market assumptions. Under the current environment, you can change your SAA perhaps every three months or every six months if you like. So if the kind of the if the facts change 
if the environment changes, then rather than sort of taking kind of active decisions against your SAA, maybe you just change your SAA. And that's the way that you sort of introduce a different kind of asset allocation in your portfolio. So anyway, as a, as a summary, I'd say that kind of that where the breadth of the decisions are narrowest, that's probably the area that you're least likely to take kind of the biggest views. Where you've got the kind of the, the biggest I guess, investing environment, let's call it global equities. You know, I'd be much more comfortable having eight or nine views in, embedded in my global equity portfolio. Let's say that I decide that I like EM as a preference over developed markets, or that I like Europe as a preference over Asia and Japan. Or I like um, Japanese yen as a preference over US dollar, or I like mid cap versus large cap. You can actually kind of bring a large number of decisions into that sort of part of the portfolio, which if one of them goes sort of the wrong way over a one year time period, you're not basically kind of you haven't you haven't um, broken the bank. So that you, as long as you're getting more right than you are wrong in that broader investing environment, then I think you're kind of generally still getting kind of the right outcomes within the sort of the short term environment. So. I think you can kind of tell that I probably kind of am, am switching active risk decisions into those parts of the portfolio, maybe global equities, global fixed income, where there is the most number of instruments, most number of themes, most number of uh, breadth of decisions to be made and spreading those, those views across a wide portfolio rather than in areas such as equities versus bonds that I think is a difficult one to get right over a short time period. It's interesting. And look, it ultimately becomes almost a type of game theory as you think about it. Um, and to be fair, I don't think when you go to the casino, you take all your money, you leave a lot of it at home and it's, it's there safely uh, under control, but you take certain amounts of money that you choose to uh, put your active risk or your, your speculation or uh, views in, into play. One of the things that's really interesting you talk about there is the willingness to be flexible around the SAA. Now, I guess, you know, if you, if you think about the history of SAAs and the long-term approach to funds, it's really quite an interesting thing where you talk about, well, sometimes we may need to change it because that's how we're now benchmarked against and this is our views changed. Now, how, how do you sort of think through that that mental decision around moving SAAs more frequently alongside the need to to still outperform, right? You, you've got this performance challenge. Again, I think it's still developing and um, these are the kind of topics of great conversation that uh, we as the management team are having with investment committee and and John as our advisors. I don't think we anticipate moving the SAA that much. I still think that as investors, we believe generally you set a portfolio for at least a year, maybe focused on three years ahead. But if something changes in the environment, then actually the, the regulations probably employ you to um, think about changing your SAA as a way to restructure the portfolio into the opportunities and away from the areas of, of danger that you you now have. And so I would imagine that in general, the SAA wouldn't change intra-year, but there could be an environment that, you know, like you think back to the last three or four years, I mean, the end of 2018, the, the Fed was beginning to tighten and then sort of stopped as uh, as the President Trump sort of intervened. That was a sort of a change in the environment. Obviously, you know, March 2020 sort of brought up some interesting valuation-based opportunities because there were some very sort of assets, there were some very distressed assets out there as a result of the the pandemic news. Now, these could all be examples of environments where you would reflect the new forward-looking risk-return trade-off with a new SAA. Yeah, no, I totally, I, I, I totally see that. It makes a lot of sense, and particularly in the market regime that we're going into with increasing concerns around inflation, even the, the convexity risk of interest rates, if they do rise, there can be massive ramifications across equities, infrastructure, all real assets now are, are quite at risk given where we sit today. And so... It's hard in a traditional SAA to try and think about that as to how to then approach these uh, these decisions that now are going to come to you because of where we sit today in the uh, general scheme of interest rates. I'm curious then around, you know, how do you then think about some of these longer term assets that have been a staple to many of the super funds, particularly within infrastructure and property? These are have done extremely well for Australian super funds and they're illiquid, but they've got you know, great valuations, great performance, but at the same time, you've got this pressure from interest rates. You know, how do you think that may change in the portfolio going forward? Yeah, great topic again. I mean, I would sort of start by saying, I think the the number one question that any investment team and CIO kind of discussing with their investment committee has to tackle right now is how much duration do you want in your portfolio? So that's not just sort of duration from a fixed income context, it's duration from long duration assets like property and infrastructure, 
How much of them do you want to be linked to inflation-based earnings? Clearly, the dichotomy between growth style of equity investing versus value is that generally those securities that have a longer earning stream, therefore with higher duration, benefit most when bond yields fall. So, you know, you get those sort of very, you get those very strong linkages right now in the portfolio across the different kind of asset classes when the Fed is signaling either kind of tightening or, or easing. And that's a, it's quite a sort of a, a dangerous point because, you know, I think the kind of the, the, the natural buffering that you had in a portfolio where you sort of had equities, bonds, and then something in that mid-risk level, the resilience of most diversified portfolios for most environments has delivered very well over the last 10, 20 years. You know, think back to GFC and bond yields. I think it's coming to the point where that resilience is going to get questioned. And so what is the asset or what are the collection of assets that are going to provide that resilience if inflation looks like being more long-term sustaining or if you know the, the, the yield curve starts sort of to back up at the middle and sort of uh, long end. And that's, that's going to hit everything from your tech stocks to your values of property and infrastructure assets to your, clearly, your kind of your, your fixed income sort of assets that are, that are longer duration. So that's the number one question. The, the answer will be that no one will know exactly the answer and everything will kind of need to be a combination of scenario testing. So what happens if you get stagflation or if you get sort of inflation and, and growth? And you've got to sort of try and sort of stress test each part of your portfolio. We always like to kind of try and produce some sort of like a checklist approach whereby rather than just individual views, uh, we need to kind of just, you know, test each part of the kind of the portfolio according to a set of, of checks and find those assets that are in there that are perhaps either undiscovered or unappreciated or haven't yet been operating at high valuations that might provide that degree of resilience when the majority of the portfolio is looking kind of uh, weaker. I still think that there are pockets of the private markets assets, be it property, infrastructure, agriculture, that REST has been a long-term investor in, and private equity that will be the best places to find some elements of that resilience purely because they are generally idiosyncratic assets. There's always going to be sort of some driver to that kind of asset class return or that asset return that is not consistent with sort of bond or equity beta, uh, but you should be aware of that kind of broader duration kind of context. Are you then more comfortable to sort of move into more of the alternative space? You know, notwithstanding some of the your future, your super uh, constrictions, but, you know, a lot of these absolute return style solutions, there's a lot of now volatility hedging style solutions that are coming through. You know, how keen are you to sort of look at those areas? Yeah, so I think that we, you know, REST has been on a long-term journey of believing that investing in quality private market assets is a really great investment for our members. And um, I see no reason sort of to change that. I think that we will be continuing to find pockets and new areas of investing within our sort of private market sort of portfolio that will be, you know, great long-term value additions for our members. And, you know, we should be aware that uh, when we talk about value for members, Traditionally, we've thought about risk and return, and I'm sure you'll, you'll come to this, Alex, but we're also starting to think about impact. And it's that, that sort of 3D kind of joined up thinking of system thinking, whereby we have to think about the financial implications of our investments, but they're also going to be, you know, the universal owner context or the you know, impact approach. So there's going to be a limit because I think that uh, liquidity and you know, these sort of considerations, particularly as the government sort of introduces new measures like TERS last year, mean that we have to be probably more and more aware of systemic risks. And liquidity is one of the things that all large super funds must be, you know, absolutely on top of. So I think we have a limit, but I, I do think that uh, so unlisted assets. And your question was also about just generally of alternative assets. I would say that I think it's probably been one of the most disappointing areas of portfolio construction has been generally the kind of the, whether you call it absolute return or hedge fund or sort of systematic mm -hmm. investing. And particularly when you think about the fees that have been charged for some of these strategies that were kind of um, very much sort of claiming to be the, the parts of the portfolio that would, would provide the low correlation in sell-offs. And unfortunately, um, because much of the volatility has been sort of driven by you know, central bank action, then I think that they have as yet not delivered. Now, that probably means that just at the point where investors are starting to sort of to perhaps move away and find new ways of investing, maybe this is sort of the environment at which they will finally deliver to their promise. And of course, you know, we should look back to only 15 years ago prior to the GFC that probably in these sort of interviews, most CEOs will be saying that their portfolios needed to grow kind of alternative premier 
liquid alts types of uh, investment approaches. But um, I have to say, it's not been an area that's been tremendously well supported in terms of it hasn't delivered to its promise. Yeah, it's fascinating that the liquid alt space has had some pretty average performance to, to say the least. Uh, and a lot of the questions have come around crowding, um, liquidity flow into the market that has that has just thrown so much money in and, and these these places have underperformed uh, when markets have gone up and when markets have gone down, uh, we've seen correlations just all turn to one. And so these these areas haven't worked. One area that you didn't touch on, which I, I'm curious to get your thoughts around, is around this volatility hedging, tail hedging. I know many of funds and CIOs have told me before, look, it's not of interest to us because we're long-term asset allocators. We've got you know long duration. We can just ride this out. We've got money coming in. For many funds, yes, that's the case. But then you also do have the issue of members still have the ability to switch. And how do you then think about members switching at the same time as markets being quite depressed? You then need, sometimes you have a situation where the government has early release, more liquidity comes out. So you've got all these factors that are playing in. Uh, maybe tail hedging actually plays a role in a situation where people can move. And not only can they move out of the growth bucket, let's say, or their my super to cash, but they can actually withdraw money out. And so how do you then think about those potential risks and whether you know, tail risk hedging maybe does play a role today? I, I certainly haven't given up on tail risk hedging. I, um, I think that there are some tremendously interesting strategies out there. Unfortunately, I still feel like the main value add is in the fees that you, you pay for them. And if you can develop your own in-house capabilities across capital markets to think about you know, careful use of futures, synthetics, currencies, I think you can deliver quite a lot sort of yourself with, with smart thinking sort of internally in the fund. But you know, the, the fact is that if there is a, a great strategy out there that, that I think the, the balance of, of return and net returns after fees are still in the favour of the member, then I think we would be very kind of amenable to it. I mean, all the topics that you mentioned there, you know, partly you, you manage that through your own sort of liquidity profile. In general, right now, listed assets have remained quite liquid in most, in most sell-offs. So, you know, most most funds still have over half of their assets in um, in listed assets, and uh, you know they have pr- provided great areas of liquidity, mainly through central bank sort of pump priming, really. So, you know, I think it's a combination of every fund wants to have some cash, whether it's because it because it's a liquidity supply, whether it's because it's dry powder for sort of investing in distressed assets when times get tough, or the combination of for me cash listed assets. And then something in there that just sort of enables you to sort of to insulate the portfolio in tough times is probably kind of the right combination. Mm-hmm. Well, you've got the the US dollar, uh, US Australian dollar trade that has, has always seemed to work. So maybe you've got one potential win that's quite cheap to actually implement there. What you did touch on there was also around derivatives. And it actually got my mind thinking around capital efficiency and ways to sort of use derivatives to try and get exposure to things, but do it quite you know, efficiently from a, a portfolio allocation perspective. Just curious around your thoughts there. I know, the, I think it's the Future Fund has been doing a little bit of work in this space as a couple other funds are, are looking at it. Uh, have you thought about that at all? We have, Alex, yeah. And I would actually credit my previous employer and um, investment team at Morningstar. This was sort of an area that uh, I feel that, that when I was there and, you know, previous to my arrival, they did really well. So if you think about it, you know, you've got a, a set of managers and internal investors who you want to be, you want to give a mandate to, and you want them to generally be given a consistent long-term mandate where they're trying to add that alpha, that, that value for, for members. When you put all those managers together at different points in the cycle, there will be a certain exposure bias in the portfolio, be it mid-cap, small-cap bias, or might be that all the fixed income managers put together kind of have a, a short duration bias. I think the opportunity then is to use derivatives to really kind of to be laser-focused as a whole of portfolio on the right mix of physical exposures, be it, you know, securities in certain countries, be it, you know, securities between government credit and high yield in fixed income. But then what particular exposure do you want to the US dollar versus the exposure that you want to the US equity market? What exposure do you want to uh, investment grade credit as opposed to the exposure that you have to duration relative to a, a Bloomberg ag index? And that's where I think you can be kind of really smart in kind of getting all the benefits of 
managers giving you their unconstrained views, but you put the whole thing together and you can skew the portfolio in the particular direction that makes sense of that whole portfolio approach. I think most fixed income managers are going to find value at most times in the cycle in going up the spectrum towards high yield. The challenge comes is that if you have all your equity managers focusing on value in small and mid-cap securities and you have all your fixed income managers focusing on value in, in high yield, when a particular kind of environment happens, then those two asset classes are too correlated and they don't, don't provide you with the traditional buffering that you want. So you can take some of that out through you know, either introducing duration or introducing the currency. And that traditionally has worked as a really great way of, kind of reducing the downside risk making sure that when the kind of the sell-offs come, you don't lose as much money as the as the beta investor. And to put my, my beliefs on the table, I do believe still that the way that most investors differentiate themselves over time as being you know, better investors is all about not how much money you make when times are great, but how little money you lose when risk, risks are off and when the markets are falling. I think it's a great transition to uh, systemic risk, uh, impact you've talked about. You know, a lot of people talk about ESG and sustainability, but it's much bo- it's much broader than just climate. Uh, there's a lot of big issues that come alongside sustainability from a financial perspective, the fully functioning of markets, the, ab- the ability to allocate capital efficient- efficiently, and so forth. You know, how do you think about these broader risks? You know, as as a you know, a large super fund with over two million members, uh, these broader systemic risks are, are becoming more and more prominent. You know, how do you measure the impact of, of some of the biggest concerns that you have and at the same time take those insights into the portfolio? Yeah, so we want to be system thinkers, Alex, and that really means that we are aware and we're factoring in that the the world, unfortunately, is getting more complex in the way that it all kind of works together. There's a lot more going on and it's almost like sort of a more complicated jigsaw puzzle than kind of existed in the past, right? Because the whole world of climate change or a focus on carbon or focus on ESG is probably the biggest challenge that we have as investors that we've experienced in our kind of lifetimes and generation because the framework is still developing. It's not clear how capital markets will price in change of information when, for instance, there's a change in the policy regime towards perhaps the price of carbon or towards a regulated kind of focus on emissions. So we have to kind of to to be aware that there's a lot of uncertainty there on one hand, you can say that anything that kind of that looks positive from a low carbon or a transition of energy kind of environment looks expensive today because it's just a sheer sort of you know weight of numbers of capital kind of going after sort of a, a small number of assets. But you know the opportunity is is for the whole system to sort of to build a better way of transitioning energy from where it is today with a focus on fossil fuels towards sort of the future. And the thing is that climate change. Is, is critical to have that collaboration across super funds to build that new framework because climate change is actually a collective action problem because you do need the scale of lots and lots of asset owners around the world all doing similar things to actually see the impact and effects of what you're doing. So on one hand, you want to be kind of doing something different and seeing you know how capital markets are going to, going to respond and having a sort of a view that's different to other asset owners. But actually, as a whole, you do want the whole asset owning community kind of globally to be focusing on this topic and uh, collaborating and implementing together to sort of see the sort of the effects. So um, REST committed to a 2050 net zero carbon target in December 2020. You know, we've still been working through kind of various of those pathways towards how we set a 2025 or 2030 sort of uh, initial target. And we very much... um, expecting to get there by July next month. But I, I think the thing that I've been kind of working around this is just uh, how to bring this sort of this new lens to investment teams as to how they decide kind of the assets that they will buy and what, what collective value is across the portfolio. It's a tough problem. And I have to say that as a CIO, it's probably going to define me or define the way that kind of the rest is viewed over the next five or 10 years as to how we take on this problem. Yeah, look, I I see it much broader, you know, and and there's so many issues to look at. There's a big one, particularly in the US at the moment, around antitrust and and the big tech firms uh, and their monopsony power in the way that they work with suppliers, the way where they work with their own uh, employees, how they dominate markets. There's a lot of these sort of issues that 
we're starting to see you know, political movements that are pushing back against it. And a lot of the super funds are still very big allocators to these very large tech companies. How, how do you think about these sort of issues that sort of almost play through the, the portfolio? Yeah, the question is, are the capital markets going to do it do it for us? So the, the recent uh, action that was imposed on Shell in the Netherlands, where, you know, they were told by the regulator to kind of to get to a certain carbon point within a certain time. You know, will, will the capital markets effectively force the hand of CEOs, CFOs with regard to strategy of listed securities? Or will we as the collective asset owners have to move quicker, have to actually sort of get ahead of any global collaboration at the regulator level? I think the private markets is going to be really interesting because they perhaps won't be regulated at the same pace, but will the pricing and the um, price discovery of, of private market assets reflect listed market securities in the way that they transition? Will it go quicker? Will it go slower? And how do you sort of use that those different speeds to try and get ahead of the value with regard to private market assets? You know, the answer to your question is we're going to have to watch a number of different things. We're going to see what actually gets driven by regulation in listed securities. I expect right now, if you know, if you're asking me on July the 1st, that we will get a very long way towards net zero carbon in listed securities by 2030. I think 2050 is already kind of being, being um, considered way too slow. But how the kind of the, uh, the overall global financial system sort of adapts within private markets is going to be really interesting. It's an interesting debate there around the role of activism, uh, and that's through members, it's through super funds, it's through governments versus the failure or success of, of markets and, and capitalism ultimately. And we, we seem to be in a bit of a debate here and a, and a battle between those two groups. That's right. I mean, I would personally put my chips on shareholders and activist shareholders and asset owners to, to get uh, action quicker than perhaps governments or regulators. So I think that uh, the pace is now quickening and I think that most of our members, anyway, when, when I talk to them and from what I understand, expect us as material shareholders of listed securities to be voting a certain way, to be considering their views when it comes to sort of to various proxy votes and alongside kind of what's the best financial outcome to all, again, think about that kind of that impact that, and what would members want you to do when it comes to a, a vote? So I think that's going to very quickly kind of come through to CEOs and CFOs and thinking about their strategy and what they decide to put in front of shareholders. So I would, I would back the collective action of, uh, of shareholders over any other kind of stakeholder. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an interesting, I think, time for the next sort of five, 10, maybe 20 years as you know, there are so many groups and all different people have different views, different ideologies, different religious backgrounds that's affecting how they invest how you keep all those people under control in the way that they all feel happy and everyone's being re responded to in the right way is going to be extremely tricky. Yeah, well, you know, it's here in the mainstream. It's not sort of on the side anymore. And uh, there's never been a more important time to, as an asset owner, get close to your members. You need to know who your members are, what they think, and uh, you need to be very confident about how you communicate with them. Because if you communicate in the wrong way, it's pretty clear that your members will tell you that, you are not representing their interests appropriately. Mm -hmm. And uh, and clearly, you know, many super funds and, and indeed REST have kind of have been in the in that sort of particular kind of firing line recently. So you need to you need to get close to members. And you know, for any of my team who think that um, investing in a super fund is just about getting a collection of assets and, and going after financial returns, I think that we have, you know, really clear direction for them with, that is that we need to build a kind of a, a member focused approach to investing and that is with that sort of system thinking that universal owner kind of lens towards risk return impact being very important and um, I think most of the work that the leadership team at REST have been doing is about understanding our members better. The next place I think then to to talk to is how to broaden your lens right broaden your 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 vision and your worldview you know, you've worked uh, around the world, you've seen a lot of different uh, countries and, and how they approach and how they think and, and how they choose to invest. At the moment, most of the Australian super funds are really populated with a lot of people that have been in Australia, maybe with an international view, but less so people working overseas. We've seen Australian super you know, looking to expand globally. You know, is that something that REST would be open to do? And how do you think about trying to bring in as many different international views around markets, around politics, particularly as geopolitics is becoming so important? How do you think about sort of taking those elements into the portfolio? 
That's right, Alex. I mean, I, I'm fortunate that I've worked, uh, you know, for investment companies in both the UK and the US. And in my previous role at Morningstar, I was sort of in a, an Asia Pacific role. So I traveled to Hong Kong, Japan, India, Singapore regularly. For me, it's part of kind of the challenge of investing is really understanding kind of the, the approaches to uh, building an investment portfolio from different perspectives when you travel around the world. Look, the one thing that Australian super funds do very well is that they do have a an outwards focus on interacting with other sort of similar asset owners and super funds from either, you know, perhaps Canada or uh, the Middle East. And so there's been a very strong sort of network of Australian asset owners kind of connecting and thinking about best practice in that space. Um, I think certainly the, the Canadians and the Kiwis and the Australian super funds are all very much sort of have been leading the charge in that in that regard. When it comes to having people that have that perspective globally, again, I would say that many of us who are either at rest or have sort of experienced in my kind of career in investing, we've all sort of sought to try to travel or we've all sought to have sort of some time either working, you know, in Europe or, or the US. So I would say that our team at rest is, uh, is like that. We've all sort of, many of us have had some experience outside. So what I guess, what does it teach you? It teaches you that you have to think hard about uh, domestic bias, but you have to also be aware that taxes and fees are important. So if you do get tax benefits from investing domestically, you should be aware of that in the way that you think. It does teach you that, you know, the approach to fees is different around the world. And probably Australian super funds have been one of the most vociferous in sort of seeking value at the fee level versus sort of um, other funds. I think that's that's important, by the way, particularly when you've got members that potentially um, you know don't have huge balances of super and you aren't going to deliver them that sort of that beautiful kind of commercial of walking down the kind of beach hand in hand in your in your retirement then if you're just providing that sort of that extra little bit of money to help with the uh the bills in retirement then the fees that you get charged as a member are important so kind of keeping fees low is, is critical you know it teaches you that the established sort of approach to investing in australia where property is always being kind of part of everybody's portfolio well, that's not always the case. In other countries, when you go to India, then basically no one would not have gold. Everyone has gold in their portfolio. If you get to the, the US and you think about why do people invest, mainly it's because of their kids going to college. And so they have perhaps a sort of a shorter time environment. They might have five, 10 years. And uh, their main reason for investing is to you know, get their kids through that kind of huge expense, which is in their life of, of college fees. So, you know, that reason for investing is critical and, and what's the sort of the, the asset class that kind of the, forms the, the core of everybody's portfolio. You know, you get to Europe and you find that high allocations to, to bonds are the norm. So never assume that uh, just because, you know, one country thinks that uh, portfolio should always be, you know, property focused is the way that everyone else thinks. Your last bit about um, would rest expand internationally? Well, um, I have to say that we've, we've already got four people outside of Australia. We've got two in London and two in New York who have generally been working on infrastructure opportunities. I think that we're having, uh, there's going to be a kind of a critical time in the next 12 months where I'd like us as, as an investment team to work with the board towards choosing the first single location that we start to build real critical mass and presence outside of Australia. And, you know, is it about building emerging market or Asia-based equity portfolios? Is it about our real assets and infrastructure where potentially North America is the place? Or is it perhaps more about net zero carbon and green focused infrastructure and, maybe, and property? Maybe that's Europe where we, we need to be located. So I think it depends on what the sort of the, the next step we're taking as a team are. But yes, we're definitely up for it. And I know that the board and investment committee are up for it too. All right, Andrew, that's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Alex. And I really appreciate it being on the uh, podcast today. Thank you for joining us. All views expressed on this podcast are subject to change and do not necessarily reflect the views of Connexus Financial. This podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be relied upon as investment advice.